Yay! Here we go. Going live. Hooray. Oh, ba -da, ba -da. Yeah, it's another Tool Tip Tuesday. <laughs> we go setting it up and we're going live for Tool Tip Tuesday. Here Yay. we go. Yay! Here we go. It always yeah. takes a minute. There we go. Okay. And music with the boot. There we go. All righty. So, welcome everybody to another Tool Tip Tuesday. I'm Jennifer from Little Metal Foxes and Julia, also from Little Metal Foxes. And Helen. Helen from Little Metal Foxes. <laughs> and we have a special guest with us this week. Julia, you want to introduce Nisa? Sure. So, Nisa Blackman is going to be teaching a class for us this coming weekend on called Drawing in Space um making 3d structures in steel and so we asked her because we always want to know about the tools we asked her to come and talk to us about her favorite tools for doing those processes and maybe show us a little bit of the work and give us a little teaser for the class this coming weekend so and she was very gracious to accept yeah. <laughs> and I, do the extra do the extra work for us so i gotta tell you i love love your sculptural work i love your enamels and your um yeah. your uh, slot together pieces are just brilliant and i i just think working with the steel pieces and drawing in space is just sexy as hell i love working <laughs> with the steel so so i'm a huge fan i love your work and um and i'm very excited about the class so um so yeah what's uh what do we got what have you got going on what what's uh, any aha moments this week or um, this month with new tools or stuff that you love or big discovery well, what have you got I um, I think what I wanted to try to get across for this is the fact, that, first of all, the fact that you don't, may, maybe this is disappointing for you, but you actually don't need a lot of specialized tools to that's work. Great. That's great. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's no, we, the lovely love things about it is, is that if you are a metalsmith and you have all the basics, that's really pretty much all you need with, with maybe just a few exceptions and and with a couple of considerations so let me first of all show you what it is that you're working with or what it is that i'm working with and that, that i'll be talking about this sunday um so this is it this nice. is this is dark annealed um it's about 16 gauge steel wire this is the kind of stuff that they would tie rebar together when they're making um you know road beds or laying yeah. foundations um, this is, <laughs> we used to call it baling wire down on the farm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is, it is the most unglamorous, you know, humble down to earth material, um, which is nice because it's not terribly expensive. You can get a roll like this. This is about probably, a, I don't know, a, about a 300 foot roll, maybe somewhere between three and 400 foot that would run you probably, I don't know, this is from like a big box hardware store, about mm -hmm. seven or eight dollars, maybe. Yeah. Um, it's been a while since I had to buy it, so it might be a little more expensive now. But still, once you have 300 yards of something or 300 feet of something, it's going to last you. It'll a last you time. a little, a hot minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then you can also get it in smaller gauges, which I in do. Smaller amounts, use. right? So, yeah, yeah. And um, <laughs> it used to be really easy to find this stuff, like at Ace Hardware, in these little roll packs. But it's getting harder to find it, and so lately I've had to order it online um, from a place called like the Hillman Group. Mm -hmm. And you can get different gauges from them. So I usually use, I use mostly the 16 gauge, the big dark and yield stuff. Um, but then I also use 20, or I'm sorry, it comes in 19, it comes in 22, you can get it in 24. And you can get this really, really fine stuff in, which is 28 gauge. I don't wow, know okay. Like oh. Really, really skinny. Really thin. Yeah. I love those, and so I love those blister packs because they, they control the wire. Yeah. Right, like do. don't take it out of mm -hmm. don't don't disassemble the pack. Right, Cut right, because the, you can also buy them like this, but these get messy, you know, if you're right. not careful. Right, and so the blister also, packs are good because you can just pull yeah. it out. It has it, you know. As you need it, yeah. And also because they're somewhat sealed, it helps protect the stuff from rusting because that is the one thing with steel yeah. that you you don't have to worry about with with other with non ferrous metals is rust. Rust never yeah. sleeps. Right, never sleeps. sleeps. Yeah, we were talking about we'll be talking about how to thwart that um, during the workshop quite a bit. Okay, so then I'm I also like a whole lot this stuff. This is eighth inch cold rolled square steel stock, and you can buy it in 
three foot lengths, one foot lengths, depending on where you get it from, sometimes four foot lengths. Um, is it is a, a mile. It's a strip. It is a square. Yeah. Okay, okay good, good. It's yeah. a square. Yeah, I like this because I'm always building, you know, structures. And this, with these, you have, you can have nice, you know, flat edges that fit together. Right. So the thing, the thing to remember about it, it is a mild steel product. Um, this is not key stock. That's important because key stock has a coating, which is zinc, which you don't want to be trying to solder with. Um, okay, so cold rolled steel stock in eight, eight inch is most useful to me, but you can also get it in quarter inch. Okay. Which is a little heftier, you know, it takes a little more stuff to deal with, but you can also get that. And so then, is that something you could find like in the KS rack at your Ace Hardware? If, if your hardware store still has KS metals, yes, you can okay. often find that. And you can also find things like tubing. Yes. Oh, tubing. My yeah. local Ace Hardware has a really nice KS rack and has a lot of stuff. I miss that so much. Yeah. I really, really miss that. Um, these are, however, this is stainless. This is not oh. my. Feel. So that makes a difference in with its, some operations. And I'll talk more about that again uh, during the workshop on Sunday. Okay, cool. so those are your basic materials. Um, is wire of just about any gauge um, and stock, steel stock. Now you can also use round like steel rod. Again, the mild steel is easiest to work with. It'll be the easiest to do any forming with. Um, you know, if you want some, it's a little bit bigger than the wire yeah okay. well one of the um, things i like about this stuff too i mean not only is it great for making i think we're really used to having the steel in our studios for things like binding wire and mm -hmm. using it for things like that and so exactly. it's really common to have it in the studio right. already i've got several blister packs of the very gauges you were talking about i've got the bigger mm -hmm. stuff like this as well and um there's something really like i said really nice about having a big steel roll like this in your studio for you know making yeah. things like soldering you know contraptions and I use, it right, clamps. I use it for making little clamps and things yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. I use it in the enameling kiln to prop things up in you know yeah. interesting ways exactly. to make custom trivets kind of thing mm -hmm. so. and it's a, but it's annealed which is really nice so it's yeah. easy to bend it's easy to sort of shape into what you need and so that's one of the, the really cool things about it, which I and like. And the dark stuff, um, the dark stuff, they call it dark annealed. And that dark coloration is actually a coating, which if you, you know, you'll sand that off before you start soldering and working with it. But this also prevents rust. Mm -hmm. So, so again, right. that dark, those dark annealed wires are the ones you want to look for. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, okay. do, can we use um, like our regular tools for that or what, what tools? For do the most part, and that's, that's a good segue there. For the most part, um, you can use your regular tools. The one or two areas you really want to be careful, though, is any kind of edged cutter. Um, if you want to work in steel, I highly recommend investing in a good heavy-duty diagonal cutter like this one. This is channel lock. Um, it wasn't, they're, they're not cheap but they're not an arm and a leg either. And they will last you forever because if you just try to use just regular little nippers or regular little household cutters, uh -huh. you'll, you'll ding them. You will ding them because cutting this stuff, the wire, you know, is no joke, especially the 16 gauge yeah. side. So make sure you've got a good heavy duty, you know, good pair of uh, diagonal cutters to get this. And again, I like the channel lock and they make, larger ones of these and smaller ones, but it's, it's these blades. The blades are really high quality. So yeah. um, that, that's right. where you're going to depart. And you um, really want a dedicated pair for, for steel like that. You definitely do. Yeah. I don't, I don't use my regular cutters on steel yeah. ever, ever, ever. Right. Um, the other thing you need to remember is that with your, uh, let's see, saw blades, you can use exactly the same thing that you would in your regular saw frame, except you're going to use heavier blades. So anywhere from like two aught is probably the the smallest size blade I would use anywhere up to a three, depending on what I'm cutting. So regular jeweler saw blades, you know, whatever kind of frame you like, you don't it doesn't have to be anything separate for that. Um, the other thing is files. Okay, just like a cutter, um, you got to have files that are gonna are going to file on the steel. They're gonna make an impression on the steel. And I keep a set of kind of kind of just crap household files. I mean, they're not crappy. I call them crap files, but but they're just basic, like a basic Nicholson file. Yeah. yeah, inexpensive. Get them at the hardware store. And I keep though, you know, some of those, a half round, uh, you know, a mill bastard file 
I keep a set of those that I only use with steel. And the same thing with your needle files. Don't yeah. use your good <laughs> Friedrich Deke, you know, or Swiss oh, cut files. Yeah. Don't use those on steel. Get some from the hardware store. Um, don't get the really cheap, crappy ones because the like no one should use those. But get you know get a get a set that you can. No one should use them. those. They should not right. be allowed. I, yeah, I've been buying some from Harbor Freight lately, and some of them are just they're not great. Um, but you need yeah you need some that you can dedicate to steel. Um, yeah. And these work just fine for the mild steel, especially. They're great, no problems at all. Right. Um, okay. So, so let me let me, let me say a little something about cutters because we mm -hmm. actually were talking with Ian Weber about these new cutters, right? These are the Lindstrom cutters, mm -hmm. which are the the TRX 8180, and these things, these puppies are serious business, and they are super nice. Mm -hmm. They will and cut okay the steel. Too? They will cut the steel yep. up to three millimeters, which I think is like nine gauge. Yeah. Wow. Um, and they have this cool feature with the the spring that you can have it so that it doesn't have the spring on. And then when you push this underneath like this, mm -hmm. then it has the spring. Right. So What's it's like the on off. Again? It's the, where is it? TRX. Here, let me get it around here so you can see it. It's the TRX. Say that again. TRX 8180. 81, so 80. if Thank and they're you. they're designed to cut non-ferrous metals down to like 24 gauge, right? And then mm -hmm. up to they'll even cut piano wire, small gauge piano wire. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, those channel locks will cut the tempered and the stainless wires too. That's another reason right, why I keep right. them around. Yeah. So and just just you know like if you were thinking about getting a new pair of cutters, Lindstrom has a good option as well. That's all I want yeah. to put that in there. <laughs> the things you were saying about the the spring. So if you if you look here, there's a kind of a little kickstand on the side. And if you pop it out like that, it actually adds your Works spring. spring. Mm -hmm. yeah. But so you can have a spring or not have a spring. And that means you can put it away so that it's not right. So the points when you're putting it away, the points mm -hmm. aren't living open. Right. Yeah. Nice. So okay. yeah. So shout out um, to Thanks. <laughs> other uh... Other tools that I have that I found to be really necessary is is something that will help you straighten the wire um, uh, because if, yes. you, if, you're, if you're getting it off of the, like I like this kind of roll because it doesn't put huge kinks in it. But somebody gave me this one uh, time, which okay, free wire is free wire, but it when you pull it off, that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Bob Ebendorf, bless his heart, showed me a fast way. Like yeah, this is coming. What a great from guy. And this is coming to turn something like this, okay, to look like that. Bam, it's, all right. Yeah, and what all you do is you need you need a good pair of pliers with teeth. And I actually, uh, this was what I could find on short notice. Um, these are a vice grip, but I prefer the real vice grip so you can lock it yeah, down, I okay? And then you need a bench vise. Okay, this is the one I use. It's not huge, but kind of the bigger the better. If you've got a big honking one, that's even better. So you put your wire, <laughs> whoops, put your wire into the bench vise, and you need to put a T on the end of it or something like that, because otherwise it'll just pull right out. Okay, so yeah. you lock your wire in there, lock it down, and this is I'm using I'm probably using about a four foot length of wire at a time. <laughs> then you put so imagine this. Imagine this is four feet long. And then you mm -hmm. lock your, your vice grips on it. Again, locking vice grips, not the ones that you have to hold on. And then you just rear back and yank on it as hard as you can. Yeah. Two or three or four times of that, or until mm -hmm. your shoulder pops out of its socket, um, that will do yeah. a lot, yeah. a lot of straightening. Um, yeah. It won't take everything out, especially on the really kinked stuff like this. But after that, you can go after it with your typical, you know, steel bench block anvil. Right. Um, you know, mallet, a uh, rawhide. Not having to do every situation. single one of those bazillion kinks. Like you take yeah. most of the kinks out, and then you only have to do a couple kinks, and then yeah. You're... Then it's yeah. like then if you you know if you've got a a, a dead blow hammer or a, a big big heavy rubber mallet or a big um, uh, cartoonishly large rubber yeah. mallet, as Jennifer <laughs> well, say. and rubber. I mean, it has to be hard. Okay, right. so it can't it can't be like soft rubber mallet, but right. but a pretty hard one, and also. 
if you've got like, I don't, I've been doing this for 30 years. So I finally bought myself a new nice bench block. Um, and I kept the old one for guess what? Working with crappy steel stuff. Right. So right. again, make sure you've got a, a surface that's not going to get dinged up. Now yeah, the good thing about that wire that gets dinged up. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that wire, it's one, it's mild steel, and two, it is dead soft. So yeah. you really you, you can bang on it pretty good sure. enough to get it straightened yeah. out without you know yeah, without your face it. hardened. That's yeah. right. Now right. I know another another trick that some people like to use for um, like rolling is is actually rolling between like two boards. Yes. Just, yes, uh, you can totally do that. Some like hardwood maple blocks. Yeah. Or plates yeah. and you can you can roll it back and forth between them and that's yeah that's a great that's a great way to do it yeah if you don't have the if you don't have the shoulder strength <laughs> <laughs> right. I would, I actually, I'll, actually will, I'll actually do the the snap i'll do the snap with the vice mm -hmm. and then i'll take it and sometimes and roll it put it in the, the board yeah. yeah yeah it's always a combination of those processes because yeah. I, I wish you could get it all out with the yanking but you can't yeah. it just the worst yeah. of it up but hey okay. at least you can get most of the way there and that's yeah that's, that's yeah especially condition. when i was dealing with this stuff that was a lifesaver yeah, um, yeah. otherwise it's like tink 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 tink, <laughs> tink tink for three days you know yeah, yeah. Like, not desirable okay um other things that i found really useful so once you get it straightened then of course you're going to cut it to whatever lengths you want um our friend here this is like this was probably the third tool that i bought as really? a metal piece back in the early 90s and it's, it is like, it is a lifesaver. I think I probably use this every day in the studio, just about. It's, oh. it's just a good basic tube cutting jig. Right. right. They, I love that you can take the, the handle off, you know, you, you can take can, the handle yeah, off and let it sit on the flat on the bench. That's how I usually use mine. Oh, do you? You can take the handle off and put it in a vise. The bottom yeah, of it. Yeah, exactly. Or clamp it down to your bench right here. Yeah. 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 No, these things, these things are great. Get a good one. Um, but I use this thing all the time because it gives you that nice clean end and you don't have to spend your time filing off the nasty points that these will leave. Okay. Right. So, and, and if you have a bunch of them to cut little pieces, the same size, this. Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I used it actually with the chime ball class to cut. I have the, the bail on this. You can't really see here. Mm -hmm. um, so the bail on this is a little piece of tubing, right? Mm -hmm. And it's, it's yeah. cut at an angle. To make the bail, because I wanted a a bail that was didn't have a solder seam in it, and so I used that little guy to great idea to mm -hmm. cut that angled yeah. piece to make a bail. Yeah. yeah. Um, another tool that I use a lot, especially when I'm working with the the eighth inch stock, those those nice square pieces, um, are one of these little guys. Yeah. Okay. So these are, I don't know what you'd call them, but the they are jig. Yeah. It's like, a, yeah, it's, a, it's an angle cutting jig or a, uh, but you can cut flat sides with it too. So it's got a variety of, of little holes that you can put your wire into and file like a 45 degree angle, a 60 degree angle, or a, a, a right angle, a, a 90 mm -hmm. degree angle. Yeah. But this is tool steel. Even the inexpensive ones are like, you can file the ends of your stock and the ends of your wires to the proper angles without right. damaging this, the yeah. surface. Yes. Well, and that's and one of the things that's nice about that that I like so much is that you can do that. You can like I've had so many people use things like the tube cutting jig, and with this, when you cut it, you can mm -hmm. file and sand it so it is absolutely square. So if you're doing right. two exactly, yeah. exactly, because I, I don't know about you guys, but there's always a little bit of drift. You know, yes. I'm always yeah. I'm always well, just a little bit off when I cut with this yeah. thing um well, with wire it doesn't matter so much but with that square steel stock you're yeah. trying you know if you're trying to get really clean right. angles yeah. yeah you're going to want to clean them up or just do your cutting with this thing yeah the other thing i like about that nisa that a lot of people um don't realize is it also has a stop like the tube cutting jig that comes with it that goes in the holes um that are just like the is the that holes. what these holes are for yeah. mine, did not, mine did not come with a stop and well, I'll tell you, I looks like, like a little it, Allen wrench, basically, is what it, it looks, looks like. like a little Allen okay. Yep. So okay. Yes. Uh, Julia, flip it over here. So yeah, let me let me spotlight yeah. you first. So hey, this is great because it's a tooltip for Nisa. Yeah. But yeah. You, you've got the steel that'll fit in the hole, right? So it's got these holes on the bottom that is just a piece of round. It looks I thought it came with two different hex keys, and it, one of them's actually round wire. So mm -hmm. it fits in. So you can put a stop up like that, 
and then tighten it because it has like the little um things on the side and that, then you, you have little are, that's, that's what, what these are, for. are for i never knew what these were for on it oh my god you guys are great yep i love that's that awesome. so then you can right. cut repeating lengths yep. yes yep. yes that's perfect exactly all yeah. right god, stop just like the, every day. Uh, yeah that's awesome okay that. so yeah so these are super handy especially when you're trying to construct um with precise precise angles right um, Okay. I'll give you I'll give you a little tip about using the um the, that I learned from Alan Revere about using this to cut. Let's see if I can do this. So if you want to get the 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 tightest edge for this, mm -hmm. what you want to do is put your blade in the slot. Hold on, let me spotlight myself. This, this is going to get you closer to not having the drift. Put your blade in the slot. Decide which side of the slot you're going to work on, right? Because right. that's part of it, is that you have to right. pick a side, right? right. Um, tighten this up a little bit. So let's say I've decided I'm going to do the what's to me the left side. So you're going to push your blade up against the left-hand side of that slot, mm -hmm. and then you're going to angle the saw away yeah. from it. Yeah just a bit and then as you're cutting it will tend to stay stuck to the slot right because you're pushing against that, that you're pushing side against of the, it. But right. you can't just push against it because the blade will bow so you really yeah. have to tip yeah. the saw and mm -hmm. if you're pushing against the right hand side you tip the saw to the left right so and it that really has helped i i learned that from one of alan revere's videos that he did and i was like wow that because when you're cutting tubing in particular it, it oh it yeah yeah all over the flipping place so, so yeah said, and that's so like just, eventually i got to that point where i could do that but it is but it's yeah if you don't already know that it's tough what is right. that tough? so nisa check it out so what i've got is my 16 gauge wire mm -hmm. that I used and put through the holes tightened it down a little bit right mm -hmm. But if I'm cutting, because this you can cut sheet width as well as wire and, and stuff, but then you can kind of bend this up at a stop so that, you know, oh. if you're, you know, measuring something out and it'll yeah. kind of catch it as you, yeah. So nice. you can customize uh, the stop on this as well. So Very there's cool. there's all kinds of ways that you can use those little holes. Uh-huh, uh-huh, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thrilled to know what those are for. I had no idea what that, and I was constantly, I would catch myself loosening and tightening those ones on the, the the knurled nuts on the side rather than the ones at the bottom which is what you need to open it up so you're like oh, right. what, what are these why do they even have these i know i know <laughs> now you know okay um let's see the only other thing that i tool wise that i found super useful just specifically for the application with the steel wire is when you get your soldering done um and you're trying to clean up around the joints. Now we do use a special pickle for it, which I'll talk about on Sunday. Um, but it doesn't, you, you know, there's inevitably there's still some cleaning that needs to be done. So these little guys, which you can buy from Rio, oh. just little stainless steel rotary brushes. Okay. All different kinds. I actually find whoops, this one, this style right here to be the most useful. Um, but you know, just depending on what I'm working on, these larger ones, these are flat, they'll fit in a little screw top mandrel, but these are great for removing excess, you know, if that last little bit of stuff that the pickle maybe didn't get off or just trying to clean off your metal before you patinate it. Um, mm -hmm. but these guys, you know, steel on steel is steel brushes are good. And also if you have a steel bench brush. Mm -hmm. Not oh, bench brush, okay. yeah, scrub brush, or even you know, even those little steel detailing brushes that you can get at the at Harbor Freight at the auto parts store. Right. Um, yeah. It's got about the same consistency as a grill cleaning brush. Those mm -hmm. can be useful as well because they're smaller and they can get into little spaces. So for your flex yeah. shaft or your Dremel tool, these little uh, steel wire brushes, also nice. steel hand brushes of yeah. a variety of different kinds. Okay? Nice, nice. So and you'll use those mostly when you're when you're trying to clean up you know, from doing uh, various things. Cool. And that'll give you a nice oh. finish on the metal too. Say again. And that gives you a really lovely finish on the metal too. It does. It does. It's very nice satiny kind of finish, which, yeah. which I like a lot. I'm not a big shiny type and person. One of the things I like to use are the, um, the fiber wheels too, that have mm -hmm. a little bit of grit to them. I like using those because mm -hmm. it does give it a satin sort of finish. Yeah. Really anything that's, that's, you know, 
hard enough to, you know, take to take to, to surface the steel, mm-hmm. you would use the same kinds of things that you would use on non-ferrous metals. Um, mm-hmm. So anything that'll polish your brass, anything that'll polish your thing, yeah. as far as as far as sort of mechanical polishing mm-hmm. goes. Mm-hmm. Um, well, when you get to the point where you're, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say one of the other tools that I like to have around is a magnet. <laughs> Just, oh yeah. Yeah, just I have a cow magnet that mm-hmm. is that I use for a bunch of different things. But it's nice yeah. to have it when I'm working with steel because I can just pick up all the filings and stuff. Yeah, and sweep that. That could also be useful when you're soldering to yeah. sort of hold things in place. Maybe I don't know. I could see I could see having some some magnets that you keep away from the area that you're actually soldering where the flame is, but they right. can help hold your tip your things in place. And that's actually the next thing that I'll go to here is. When you are soldering your constructions, um, a nice, really flat surface like these solderite pads mm-hmm. is really is really useful. So when I'm trying to solder, like if I'm building the bottom, you know, building a structure like this, woo, look at that, all right angles, you know, with the exception of sort of the decorative parts. But when I'm trying to get these corners, you know, everything to be square, 90 degrees, so that it all goes together like I want it to, mm-hmm. um, being able to lay out your, say, your first, you know, course of those wires and get them soldered so that you know that you have, you know, your first shape is completely flat, that the corners are square. Um, and then when you go to, you know, solder wires at a right angle, like so, then You've got a flat base and then you can use, this is the other, one of the other things I find really, really useful, third hands. Mm-hmm. These are indispensable to me when I'm working on these guys, because I'm always soldering wires, you know, up in like at right angles, yeah. sticking up base against something that's flat. So I have, you know, two or three of these sitting around all the yeah. time. I use them all the time. Um, also a little tool like this. Oh yeah. <laughs> good. Yes. And this could even be, you could even have something like a little, plastic right triangle just anything that you can hold up to your joint you know to make sure that yes i've got it secured in a in a right angle you know again if i'm that's what i'm trying to achieve you know you check you can check it and say yeah it's good and then i can solder it right so right. something and this is good because it's steel and it doesn't it right. won't hurt it gets up against something hot right. um well, let's, let's see this little this piece ruler, which is pretty fun yeah, let's see this little piece again. I want to know more about the the work and kind of what you're doing with it. Oh, okay. Can I say one more thing about your soldering? Sure. soldering yeah, tools? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we can do that. Yeah. So yeah. just the like the last thing here. Oh no, actually, I lied. It's not the last thing. <laughs> also, cross locking tweezers. Okay, yeah. cross locking tweezers because again, you can put this in a clamp. You can prop things up by you know just simply propping the tweezer on something. These are super versatile and super useful, and I particularly like the one with the bent tip yep. because when we solder this stuff, this, this stuff, as we, I will show you on Sunday, um, I'm, I stick feed. I don't do anything but stick feeding and I'll, I'll tell you why on Sunday, but this is the best thing to hold a big, long yeah. okay, stick yeah. of solder. Okay. Right. So cross locking tweezers, third hands. And also um, you need to have, something you can stick your wires into occasionally. So soft fire bricks right. are really good to have, you know, have a bunch of those laying around. And then I try, I sometimes um, when you're soldering, you can solder really close together on steel in ways that you can't with silver, just because of the, the heat conductance is not the same as it is on mm-hmm. silver and copper. Yeah. But sometimes I like to put a chunk of pumice, just, this is just from my pumice pan for my annealing pan a chunk of pumice rock between the joints where I'm soldering because it will help prevent um, solder from flowing in a joint that you've already soldered, you right. know, when you're, when you're working adjacent to it. Insulating, so really, right. you're insulating yeah. the previously soldered joints, exactly, right? Exactly. Exactly. Because as we will find out um, on hot. Sunday, you don't get the same solder hierarchy with steel. Oh. We'll talk, we'll, we'll, yeah. We'll talk more about that later. We'll keep you in suspense until then, but okay. So, um, so the, this work, this is kind of, um, let me show you a different piece, a little bit easier to see. So this work oh, God. is kind of mid, sort of the mid portion of my, of my, my journey with steel wire. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's volumetric. Um, it's very interesting on the body in the way that as you move around it, 
Mm, you get different angles. Oh, the the perspective. perspective change and the angle mm -hmm. change. And this this particular series, like I said, it's something I, I started probably God, almost 10 years ago and have just sort of revisited periodically. But it came from a, a, a like a, a two-day car ride going from Illinois to Oklahoma, where my family is. And it was, it was just an interesting, I don't know how to say it. The experience was marked by the colors and the, the light, the qualities of light and the weather and the shapes that I was seeing in the landscape. And in particular, the way those things changed as we moved past them. So like, you know, if you're driving towards a, like a, a crossroad and you see that line of telephone poles that stretches mm -hmm. out, you know, mm -hmm. as you approach it and as you pass it and as you pass away from it, you know, it changes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The way that we see it changes, they, they coalesce on themselves and then they move back apart again. And it's like when you're a little, little kid laying in the back of the car, watching the, the telephone wires go by, you know, yes. And, you know yes. you so that, that moving through space and the changes that that brings about in the things that we're seeing um, was very evocative to me of the way that time and memory interact mm -hmm. and how, right, how distance and perspective, you know, changes your memories from what they are at, you know, at the moment that you see them is different than when you're looking back at them or we, even when you're looking forward to things mm -hmm. that you know, may become memories. So, so these little structures were a way to create, um, to use the steel wire in a linear fashion to build frameworks. Okay. And the framework specifically, the function of the framework was to hold these little swatches of things, different colors, different materials. So like mm -hmm. there's some antique fishing line wrapped around it. These are Formica samples. This is leather. Here's like a vinyl flooring sample. And, you know, I just been sort of collecting all of these weird little materials. And they, they, I, when I got back from that trip, I had, I had taken notes about, you know, each portion of the trip and there were, the trip kind of divided itself into three portions and based on the, the temperature and the weather and the color and the light, you know, I had these sort of three groups of, of, of visual ideas, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, I, I sorted all my weird materials into three groups. And then I started making pieces that reflected, say, this was the first, you know, morning of the trip when the light was very cool. And a, there was like snow dusted fields. And, you know, and then this was, this was later in the day when I'm in a different state and it started to rain. And so everything was very saturated and the colors were very intense and, you know, and dark because everything was wet. Um, and so, I just sort of started pursuing that idea of creating these shapes and um, being in the Midwest, I'm quite fascinated by barns, um, especially the older okay. barns. And so you know, so the, these are like yeah. the little cupola, there's the, the curved roof of the barn. Um, this, this shape came from silos, you know, and the yes. way silos change as you draw, drive past mm -hmm. them. Um, you know, this, this one was more barns. Lots of, I really, well, really, really, really love like barns like a like a teardrop trailer like a like a it looks like a trailer it, it does it does it definitely has that little right. like you know and like a car trip where you would see trailers mm -hmm. right yeah yeah and so yeah and so these these little steel frameworks which i think are quite beautiful on their own but mm -hmm. I, I can usually never leave things alone enough so i really you know i wanted to to use sort of a color blocking idea to fill some of those spaces with materials that were evocative of the things, you know, that I saw, the mm -hmm. colors, the places, the textures um, on that particular trip. And, and it's interesting that, you know, these are all about sort of memory and perspective. And the longer I go, the, you know, every time I come back to it, there's like years, more years separating me from that actual event. And it's interesting that the way that my, um, what I make is changing and becoming different. Oh, interesting. Um, so like this is a newer part in that series. Oh, I've got a little moving part there. Nice. And I'm using, yeah, I'm using some different materials still from that same stash, but but you know, the feel of the pieces is changing. Yes. Yes. The farther I get away from that. Um, that also they've also begun to incorporate my tab construction. So hmm. here's the oh. steel. Okay, the steel framework. Again, it's sort of silo top. 
but I've turned it on the side. And then this whole action here is mm. folded and have constructed tin. Okay. Nice. Tins, right. That are again, representative of shapes and, you know, farm buildings and machinery mm -hmm. and things that I saw again on that, on that same trip. So I really have enjoyed using the steel wire to establish the frameworks as sort of the support for these little moments, mm -hmm. you know, of, mm -hmm. of texture and color. But that I also- sounds like an incredibly fruitful trip. And well, you know, it was three days, a trip that I've made a million times um, since, you know, since I moved away from Oklahoma, but it was just, I think it was the act of noticing, mm -hmm. you know, and paying attention to that sort of suite of things um, and to say that I want to remember this because I want to come back to it again and again. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Were you yeah, on your own was, on that trip or did you have other people in the car with you? Uh, it was just me and my husband. So just the two of us in the car. So when he was driving, I was like looking out the window and taking notes. And right, um, right. that's kind of what I was to, wondering. Was this something yeah. that you had to take in as you were driving? Because that's a no. different kind of thing. That you I wouldn't in. have nearly as many notes if that were the case. Because right. yeah, driving, riding at the same time, not so good. But yeah. um, but, but yeah, I, what you're saying about the like the kid laying in the back of the car? Because I mean, I grew up with you know every and it's approaching the holidays, and one of my you know core memories is driving from Atlanta to Nashville, you know, through yeah. uh you know Lookout Mountain area and the um and land in the back of the country squire station wagon <laughs> mm -hmm. and chevy nova but same walking, thing yep, yep. watching same. watching the sky go by but you know going yeah. through uh mon eagle and there's just like this wall of you know this cliff and there was always water coming down but mm -hmm. then there'd be like wires on the other side so it was always yeah. this interesting juxtaposition on either side so it's just you know really mm -hmm. uh, that land in the back of the car as a kid just like struck me right then yeah mm -hmm. it's it's yeah i guess i think it. i think a lot of us have those those kinds of sort of archetypal memories um yeah, absolutely. and the the steel was sort of an, for me was an ideal way to sort of capture that yeah. um you know, i'm not much of a mark maker i'm not much of a drawer but i like the idea of establishing that line mm -hmm. in in space instead of on paper mm -hmm. um but I feel like I feel like working with steel wire is for me, that's drawing. And mm -hmm. there are now there, you know, there are 3D pens now that you literally yes. can draw in space. I'm kind of like I'm kind of intrigued by those just because it's that that really is actually drawing in space. Um, yeah. But another reason that I like working with the steel wire in this fashion is that you can make fairly large like this is a big brooch. You mm -hmm. know. Like it doesn't weigh feet. very much and it doesn't weigh anything like this is quite wearable um you know sticks out a little ways from the body but you can you can make some pretty good sized pieces and not have them weigh a whole lot right um, and as my scale starts expanding with these that becomes more and more important so mm. like huge brooch that came um from a penland workshop with caroline gore where it was sort of all about paring your work down and not having so much go into it that you obscure the narrative. And narrative is very important for me. And up until then, I had always been like a everything but the kitchen sink kind of person. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, I really wanted to say, all right, how am I, how do I draw, how do I, you know, rein myself in without losing the evocativeness of the different materials? So, so Caroline made us do, she made a, do a lot of great exercises, but one of them was like, limit your materials. So, um, you know, this was from a series where um, we, we chose one material that we wanted to work with in a way we'd never worked with anything before. And I chose colored leather and I torched it um, and I burned it and branded it and did all kinds of crazy things to it like that. And then I made pieces that I would then work into other uh, uh, um, compositions. So mm -hmm. this, is, this is a framework of steel wire. It's very, very simple. It's just a couple of crossed wires and then a circle. Mm -hmm. And then everything is attached to that. And these are also steel wire, but also um, nylon coated steel cable, which is a really wonderful kind of industrial Love. Love type it. of material. And it, it went with these quite well. But then there's, you know, you can add some things like beads. So I was trying to keep my, my material library small um, but then sort of expand my scale or space mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. the brooch and, it's you know, a, it would be more room, but not, not, uh, 
yeah. in a gentle it's sort not, of way. It's yeah, big, yeah. but it's not heavy. So mm -hmm. it increases its, its wearability. So there's that piece. This is part of the same piece. This is um, just a big strip of leather fringe that I branded with little dots. You can see those little dark dots and then sort of lightly torched the edges of the fringe to get it to curl up. Leather is like a pork chop. It's all protein. It's just skin. And when you hit it with a torch, it curls just like a pork chop under the broiler. It's it's most satisfying thing ever. So smells funny. Terrible. It's cool. It's so cool. It smells so awesome. Like it. But it's really a fun thing to work with. Um, so anyway, so I don't know if you can see, but this this wild conglomeration of this leather fringe is housed in a boat form that's made mm -hmm. from steel wire. And it's kind of hard to see the little boat form, which is- which Oh, no, is, I can it, see it. It looks it, like it, a boat it, or like it, an iron. Has a bit it, of a it, does, it, also, yeah, it also looks like a flat iron, definitely. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so you could definitely make line drawings of objects in three dimensions um, and then either adorn them or, or not adorn them. Um, I went through a phase where I was really interested in these little vessels. Um, vessels that had wheels so oh, i love so there, were, there was things like this oh. i actually i've given away or sold most of the ones that i made but this is a fairly recent one where um i did for uh, a snag exhibition no it was their uh, adorned spaces that they yeah. do at the at the conferences and so this right. the enamel society said all right folks make bowls and so we all made some sort of a bowl that was enameled so here was my you know enamel on copper mesh bowl nice. and I made a little vehicle to contain it mm -hmm. with little enameled wheels and little gold cotter pins that hold the wheels on um and there's some little gold accents on it but this is this is a mixture this one was tough for because I had square steel stock I had 16 mm -hmm. gauge wires I had thinner gauge wires up here and even the even thinner gauge wires here so um, soldering all those together is not a problem at all. But when you go to patinate with this this one particular patina that I'll talk about on Sunday, um, the different gauges become, um, I'm not going to say problematic, but you have to be aware. Yeah, because they, they some of them, they heat up faster than others. Yeah. That's the they thing. take the patina differently. Is exactly. that it? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. And it, yeah. And, and it's, this is a, well, I'll talk, I'll talk more about the patina on Sunday, but anyway, so you can build things. So this is actually, I mean, it actually rolls pretty well. Nice. Um, and I just think like a whole little series of these little linearly constructed, you know, little vessels uh, could be a lot of fun. Okay. And so you can see that the scale is getting a little bigger there. Um, I've actually made some fairly good sized pieces. Now this is, I'm not using anything but silver solder. Okay. And just the regular, the tools that I've talked about, you know, is normal metal smithing tools. So here's a pretty good sized house form, very simple house form, constructed entirely of that eighth inch uh, square steel stock. Okay, and as long as you can, each joint, you know, I would put that in the pickle, like in a shallow dish. So I was just cleaning like that one joint at a time. Hmm. Um, and that's, mm -hmm. how you, that's how you can work bigger even though, even if you have a lot of solder joints. So you do have to think about that ahead of time. Like what, what am I going to solder this thing in? Or, you know, how, do, how am I going to, how am I going to get, yeah. How am I going to clean it? Right. Right. Yeah. So here's another piece. Oh my God. Oh, wow. And this is, so this is a pretty good size piece. It's about eight or nine inches high. And you can see these little, this is just that 16 gauge wire. Mm -hmm. And it is such a, a lovely fine line mm -hmm. yeah, it really it acts like a line drawing and then I can put these again little swatches of different materials and some, sometimes I just tie those in place and sometimes those glass what are those or plexi this yeah this painted glass okay where I went I painted on glass and then scratched through it in some areas and painted on more yeah that's some different nice. colors there yeah and those are held in place with little wire clips that are just made from a, a, a skinnier, thinner gauge steel wire and soldered in place and then bent like that mm -hmm. to, accept, to accept the different materials. And you can also make little staples. So these are just staples made out of some little brass wire to hold this bit of leather in there. Mm -hmm. 
but those are very those are quite useful these little this little clip idea to hold things on um it's kind of a pain to solder all of them on but you know you have to if you make jewelry out of these things um yeah you yeah. have to think about how are you going to attach the findings mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. right because it's if if you're using say like steel pin findings the little the, the little the, the the hinge and the clasp those are steel and they'll, you know, they'll solder on just fine. But if you've got silver, you know, the silver is going to heat up way faster than the steel and that can create problems. So I, I make a lot of my findings actually out of smaller gauge steel wire. Mm. Here's the other piece of that one. Oh, those are beautiful. Thank you. And they're actually like, this is one subunit. And then this bottom is all one subunit. So oh, interesting. Like, Another way to, yeah, to so you can, yeah, right. you can display it different ways. More or, yeah. Right. right. Because again, I was looking at what I had to put my pickle in and what, you know, how big a shape could I make that would actually work in that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's some more of that vintage tin from a saltine cracker box. Nice. So so you can work bigger if you if you think about working in subunits. Mm -hmm. Um mm -hmm. let me show you this guy. Oh, wow. Right, so here's another piece. This is so cool. We get to have a tour of all your cool work. <laughs> get these, to see. Get so get what's so work. lovely about this, Misa, is that you can move it. And so people can get that real, you know, mm -hmm. experience of the perspective changing and the volumetric nature of the pieces that yeah. you, you can kind of get from looking at a series of still images, but it's not the same. So yeah. Right. yeah these are definitely made to be used in the round you know so these are tabletop size you know you can it doesn't really matter how you put them you know you can you can there's always something to see on every on every side and yeah, um, I love these panels that you put in there and the different yeah. materials that you've been using the you know between the tin the plastic the glass mm -hmm. whatever you're using oh my god it's it's you know you're just creating your own space and it's my fabulous god. Yeah, and I like that yeah. sometimes they occlude your vision into the space. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they facilitate it. There are some interesting relationships, like between the wire framework and say so this is a piece of again vintage tin with just a little cutout to accommodate where that wire comes across. Mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. It doesn't pass in front of it. Actually, it has its own little space. So you know you can make the relationships. You can between, see it from both sides. You see that same yeah exactly of it from both sides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. love it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think the steel is, it works and plays well with so many other materials. Right, right. And it also, you can make- My brain is on fire. <laughs> what was that, Helen? My brain is on fire. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the best thing about new materials is that um, you can, you know, they all, they will inspire you just on their own. So, yeah. And so this is, here's, this is a little- just a little sculpture, super lightweight, very airy and open. It's got these funny little, you know, these are like brass tubes and copper tubes, but with a steel framework. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's just, it's lovely. I, I really, I really enjoy it so much. As material. I, I, I love that. Well, we've got uh, another minute left here um, to just sort of like sum up and uh, any last minute uh, tips you can think of? Any last minute um, that we can share with our really um, I think, I think just, you know, come to it with an open mind as far as what the material can do. Mm -hmm. Um, and, oh, I actually one I do have one last thing to say is that, um, again, we talked about rust at the beginning, another tool that you might not think of this as a tool, but when you go to store these pieces, um, you know, I'll talk definitely on Sunday about how to seal them, how to protect the surfaces, but you always want to think about storing a, a piece that's made out of steel work. And so I collect these little desiccant packets and desiccant, you know, these come in, they come in your drugs, they come in your shoes, they come in, you know, all kinds of things. Save these because you can store a piece, you know, wrapped in tissue in a plastic something, some plastic, whatever, and you just drop those little desiccant packets in there with it. And that goes a long way towards retarding the rust and, and protecting that piece for, Right. you know, when it's being stored or shipped or something like that. Yeah. Well, because sometimes you get, especially in plastic, you can get condensation. And, right. Right. and right. that will definitely uh, yeah. 
all about. So, yeah. 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 I know when yeah. I was in the Peace Corps, I had I had a tin of desiccant, this metal tin of, of the kind of desiccant that you can bake, right? Mm -hmm. So I could keep it in with my camera. Mm -hmm. So, like, if you're making larger pieces, and especially if you're selling them and you want to send them home with somebody in a way that they, you know, if they're right. being stored or a museum is holding it, mm -hmm. you know, put in a tin yeah. of the desiccant that you can yeah. bake and reuse, reusable Exactly, desiccant. exactly. Yeah. When I shipped a lot of these works to a gallery in New York, they all came, they all went in their own boxes with their own little desiccant bags in there with them um, because you just never know what's going to happen on the way. And it was just, you know, just a little way that I could uh, yeah. add to their protection. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, you have to yeah. be thinking about that when you're making a piece, you have to be thinking about yeah. The lifetime of the piece it's again it's exactly. kind of like the memory going back and then looking forward it's you're like well mm -hmm. I would want this piece to rest you know I mean you think of um yeah that's, there, there that's are really words, you know like do you do you want it do you want it to rust or Alexander Calder is is the rust a part of it mm -hmm. or do you want to prevent that right. you know? when you're um one of your colleagues in the Seattle area or at least in Washington Maria Phillips taught oh, me that Maria yeah. I love Maria. Yeah. So, and she, you know, she used to make that work with it was wire, steel wires encased in things like gut. Right. And, and, you know, she talked about the way, the lifespan of her piece and how someone who purchased a piece of hers 10 years later, they wouldn't have the same piece. Right. And that was intentional. And I was so struck by that. Mm -hmm. Um, but not everybody, like not everybody is going to have that sort of philosophy about their work. So um, that is an important thing to think about. Like this, the little piece I showed you a moment ago, this one is like, it lives in my bathroom, unfortunately. And so it's, it's beginning to rust a little, you know, I'm definitely, even though it's, it's well patinated, um, there are some changes that are happening here and mm -hmm. I'm okay with that, you know, yeah. for, for mm -hmm. this piece, it works for this piece, something that somebody has to wear on their body or on their clothing, you know, maybe not so much, but not so, much, yeah. Yeah. so thinking about the life of your work after construction, after it's sold, um, I think is important sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's, uh, and there's so many great ways to seal it. And uh, we have uh, one method that we use at work for some uh, is a decorative thing, which is powder coating. And that's mm -hmm. used in industry uh, yeah, for all kinds of things. Um, and all kinds of, you know, spray on dips, waxes, all kinds of stuff. So, uh, well, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the class and learning more. And I've got all the steel I can, I can manage to, to play <laughs> with. So I'm excited. Yep. Um, so yeah, that's going to be great. That's going to be oh, great. I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking very much forward to it. So much. And we've got um, a bunch of stuff coming up. We've got the Jingle Bell class. We've got um, open studio access coming up as well. We've got more seats for that. And uh, the holiday party coming up, but um, thank you so much for for joining us today. Really appreciate You're very it. You're welcome. Thank yeah. you for having me. Yeah, we oh, it was really it was so lovely to get to hear you talk about your your process. I mean, you clearly really love this, and it yeah. really shows even in the way you talk about you know the affection you hold for the for the writer. <laughs> oh ah, yeah. Is, well, is, yeah is I, I, I learned. The, the beginnings of working with this, I learned from someone who I admired so much, and that is um, a metalsmith named Joe Wood, who was at uh, Mass College of Art, I, I believe, for quite some time. Uh, just a lovely, lovely man. And I, I, I took a haystack workshop from him, making things out of steel wire and found objects. And that was like, that was the beginning of it. Wow. You know, that was the beginning. And I, I can't say enough about him and his work. And, um, you know, it's just something that is, I've been doing this for 30 years now. And I, I keep going back to it. I keep going back to it. It's yeah. all going to be there. It's always going to be, you know, an important part of my vocabulary. So as an artist. Well, thanks again so much. And we're looking forward to seeing it. If you guys, uh, if, uh, did we have any questions out there, Helen? Did you see any questions on the live stream? Okay. No. So uh, if you have more questions, sign up for the class and you can ask them live. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks everybody. And um, we will see you later.